Welcome to the Buy Box Bandits Podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Buy Box Bandit Podcast. Tonight, we have a super special guest, a guy who's been very instrumental with getting us started on Amazon back in the day. We have Caleb Roth, who's a multi-million dollar bookseller and founder of Scout IQ, uh, book, soft, book scouting software that was very helpful. And I used a lot back in college when I was trying to buy people's textbooks for pennies on the dollar. So Caleb, thanks for joining us tonight. We're excited to dive into your story a little bit. I am delighted to be here, fellas. Yeah, fantastic. So do you want to take us back to kind of the beginning, which I think was five or so years ago, but how you got started selling books on Amazon and how that eventually ended up being a really neat kind of portfolio of different softwares and everything you got going on today? Well, the beginning actually goes back a little further than five years. It goes back to uh, when I was younger than all of you guys. So I know I know that's hard to believe, <laughs> but I actually started in high school uh, back before Amazon was really much of a thing. Uh, eBay was kind of the main piece of the game and Amazon was just a, a small little little piece at that point. So my first job, I worked as a cart boy at a golf course. So I went in and cleaned people's clubs, put the, the golf carts away, cleaned them up, et cetera, and worked for tips. And back then I actually was kind of scared of people. And so that job actually, one, I got free golf, which was cool, but I also got to interact with people and learn how to, how to engage and be a little more outgoing than I, than I was at the time. Um, we might be glitching a bit. Yeah, we lose Garrett yeah. like every other episode. Unfortunately, <laughs> but, but he'll, he'll come he, back. He, he can oh, still hear. Tell, he can still hear you. You know what? Tell him to spend more money yeah, on his internet be, instead of his uh, jersey that, collection in the background we're, there. We're, yeah, we're working on that right now. <laughs> That's what I've been saying. So here, here's an important business tip, uh, and we can just get into it. But uh, go upstream, Garrett. The internet is going to impact your productivity and your throughput and everything else you're doing. And I suspect most of your business is done online. So pony up, get a really good router, pay for some higher speed. We, and we had uh, a, we had that's going to save you a lot of money. We had a conversation, <laughs> exact conversation on this day uh, for a warehouse in Delaware. And I said the same thing you said. Yeah, well, he's not going to listen to you. Before. You guys are his peers. He needs to hear it from somebody out, outside of his peers. <laughs> No, I know. I think yeah. that just sealed the deal. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> I think I have to make a call tonight. That's yeah, it. So, you, so you were doing the, the golf job, and I can't believe I didn't mention av, avid golfer. Avid Come golfer. Uh, Shut up. Burgeoning bourbon collector slash connoisseur. Kind of, uh, I think COVID was bad for drinking in general, but I, I started getting into bourbon and uh, collecting it. Of course, drinking it. You got to know what you're collecting. Um, but there's, there's a lot of asset classes that are going crazy. I've not gotten into NFTs. I've talked to a few people that have quit books recently and I'm always curious why, and typically it's scaling up like you guys are doing into private label or, or wholesale or some other categories. Uh, I talked to one gentleman who said he quit because he made more flipping NFTs in the last two months than he has in his book business the last year. Um, so I don't know if that's sustainable, but uh, props to him. And I know about this much about NFTs. So that's that's intriguing. Um, so, yeah, I, I was working at a golf course. My sister told me, find a job where you like the perks. And so free golf was awesome. But back then, and I know everybody complains about minimum wage now, and I'm, I'm not even that old. But back then, this would have been 2004, <laughs> minimum wage was $5.15 an hour. And, and what, I, state, I was, what state were you in? I was in Michigan. Okay. So uh, I was working part-time. I probably worked 20 hours a week. So rough math, 20 hours times a little over five bucks is a hundred bucks. Uh, you guys can make a hundred bucks flipping, you know, one product or two products in an afternoon. I was working 20, half a week to make a hundred bucks. And I got some tips, but uh, you know, I was a slightly overweight, shy, white male and didn't really get a whole lot of tips there. Uh, I think if I was female, that may have helped. Definitely if I was more engaging, that would have helped. But, you know, on a good week, I might make 20, 30 bucks in tips. So all in, I worked probably 10 weeks. It was a summer job and then went back to school. But what, what ended up happening was I was giving up my nights and weekends. So I, I grew up in Michigan, West Michigan, Grand Rapids area. The, they have unbelievable beaches. If, have you guys been to Michigan? I have. My brother I went to not. Michigan State, so I visited quite oh, a bit. Yeah. Go green, baby. Yeah, yeah, I... Go white. <laughs> <laughs> so Michigan is an undiscovered gem. There's no reason to go through it. You don't like drive through Michigan to get anywhere. You just 
go to Michigan and it, it's beautiful. Well, my friends would go to the beach and go, hey, Caleb, come to the beach. We're going to go hang out Friday night. I said, I'd love to, but I got to work five to nine. So I, I kind of missed out on some of those. And I, I got to the end of the summer and was like, that's great. I got some spending cash. Of course, gas was like a buck a gallon back then. Um, and so it, it was great. But I looked at that and said, I probably made about a thousand bucks, 10 weeks at a hundred bucks, made a thousand dollars as a 16 year old. That's, that's good cash. That's good money. But I knew someday a thousand bucks wouldn't be a whole lot. And so I said, well, I'm giving up my nights and weekends, my time with my friends, and I would rather have freedom. So I set the goal the next summer. I said, I'm not going to do the golf thing. Of course, I was getting free golf, but golf wasn't that expensive at that course. So I said, the next summer, I'm not going to work for the golf course. I am going to try and just flip stuff on eBay was the thing back then. Um, there weren't blogs. I don't, maybe YouTube existed in 04. I don't, I'd have to look that up. I, I think, think it was, it, yeah, 04, 05, something like that. It I think it yeah. launched around then, but it, 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 it wasn't big. I wasn't learning there. Yeah, but either way, information wasn't super prevalent. No. And so like your scouting app at the time was you would ride your bicycle. I didn't really have a car. You drive your car to a garage sale, write down everything with brand names, drive home, pull up your dial up internet, look it up on eBay, check out comp, see what they sold for and go, holy crap, that's a hundred dollar Polaroid camera. I got better go <laughs> run back before someone else gets it and yeah, buy it for there. two bucks <laughs> and flip it. So that's, that was the game. But again, you find one or two of those in a week. And that's, that's what you made in a week working 20 hours at five bucks an hour. So I was hooked. And, and the goal was not to make, you know, $10,000 or a hundred thousand dollars. There was no money goal behind it. It was, I want to make the same thousand dollars that I traded my nights and weekends for. And I don't care if I work 30 or 40 hours a week. I just want to pick which 30 and 40 hours I, I work so that I can go hang out with my friends on the weekends. And so that, that's kind of how I got the reselling career started. We actually got into books a little bit, my brother and I, uh, just because they were everywhere. They had barcodes, easy to research. Uh, we actually wrote a scouting application back then. We would text the ISBN to an email address. You could do that back with flip phones. Again, the first iPhone didn't come out, I think, until 07. Yeah. So smartphones weren't a thing. You would literally pull your flip phone out, type the ISBN to an email address. It would kick it back to Amazon. We either scraped or used the API, or I don't, I don't know what existed back then. We'd find the data, sales rank, uh, lowest price. We would kick it back to the email address, kick it back to the cell phone. So round trip scouting probably took 20 to 30 seconds to get an answer wow. compared to what we have today where it's you know, a tenth of a second. Instant, right? yeah. But back then, almost every book was worth flipping because there wasn't competition. Oh, and no, com yeah, no competition. So That's really interesting. Even though you're waiting, I, I, I don't think it was 20 seconds. I bet it was, you know, 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Even though you're waiting a while, you know, 50% of the books you touch are worth reselling. Wow. So we, we didn't realize that the app back then we're like this is just cool we can solve some problem on our own uh and we didn't realize that probably would have allowed us to just skip going to college and make software and uh we just kind of tabled it and forgot about it so that's that's how i got into books and then i did some flipping in college and you know i that's kind of one thing led to another that's yeah awesome. interesting and you definitely scaled that up to a big book operation and then eventually uh, transit and still do the books, but got into some different software and stuff like that. So the name is the book flipper, which I know is from Caleb at the bookflipper.com. So when did you get started with the bookflipper.com? Yeah. So I, I actually put books on the back burner. I went, did college. I was kind of the, the consignment guy on campus and, and sold textbooks for other people. I was best friends with, you know, the librarian and the, the post office lady and everything else. And then I was like, well, I went to college, went to college in Indiana, um, graduated with a business degree and said, well, I went and got this degree. I should probably go work for a company because that's what you do. And I didn't really, I didn't think that books could be a career. I didn't think that flipping could be a career. And so I said, let's just go take my college degree. I got an internship at Johnson and Johnson and did marketing for an orthopedic company. So I did, uh, project management, product management for knee replacements of all things. So if you know, you know, typically older people, their joints wear out and you go get your knee replaced. It's pretty common now. So that's what I did. I got to, to meet surgeons, travel all over the country, watch operations. It, it was cool. Uh, and really just forgot about flipping for about five, five and a half years. Then uh, realized, you know what? I'm traveling a lot on the company's dime. This is great. My salary is really good. I was saving a lot. I know 
Miles, you're really big into saving and some of your personal <laughs> finance tips. I'm, I'm kind of a, a financial junkie as well. So I was, you know, I was making this much money and spending significantly less and I had this buffer and I'm going, man, I don't want to keep working for the man. Nothing against it. That's just like freedom's important to me. And it felt weird to have to like text my boss or call, email him and say, hey, uh, I've got a, you know, car appointment tomorrow or I've got a doctor's appointment or I want to go fishing tomorrow morning and I'm going to be a couple hours late. And usually he'd say, no, come to work, right? So I got sick of doing that and said, man, I wonder if I can, like, I had a good salary. I was making six figures for J&J, but I didn't have to replace that. My living expenses were significantly lower. I was in Indiana at the time, which is where I am again. And so I, I kind of set out again. My first goal when I was 17 was, can I replace a thousand bucks in a summer? My goal here was significantly greater, but I wasn't trying to get to six figures. I was just trying to replace my mortgage at the time, which I lived in a duplex, rented the other half of the duplex. So I was kind of house hacking. Um, so to, you know, my all-in cost was 73 bucks a month, the difference between the mortgage and what the guy had paid me and my utilities. So, you know, 250 bucks a month was what it cost to be Caleb plus food, plus, you know, some insurance and whatever else. So I was looking at trying to replace 1500 bucks a month and I'd have a pretty decent life, um, you know, two, two, three grand a month. So I said, well, what do I know? And it's like, well, books, you know, books was a thing. And I kind of looked at it. Of course, there was much better tools out there and software. And I was like, well, let's just take a run at this. So I just set out with a goal of, I, I don't want to quit my job tomorrow. I'm like, that's risky. I'm going to keep the job. I'm just going to start something on the side. So side hustle is a big thing now. It wasn't as big of a thing back in uh, 2014, which is when I would have gotten into this. And I just said, what if I found a hundred books a week? Let's, you know, I'm traveling for work. I can go find thrift stores, libraries when I'm on the road. And I can just look at Craigslist, Facebook. I can find stuff locally and try and find a hundred a week. And it was, all right, if I find a hundred a week, what am I going to sell? Well, maybe, you know, three or four or five. Well, that's not real sexy, but if I can, you know, keep stacking the gains on top of each other, all of a sudden, a couple months in, I've got, you know, several hundred or maybe even several thousand books. And if I'm selling three, four or 5% a week, all of a sudden that's substantial. So that, that's what I started out with and ran that for a, almost a year to where it was really starting to ramp up. And I realized there, this can work. And by that point I was doing, you know, two or 300 books a week. I'd kind of up the ante, but that was starting to, you know, sell really well. I sold, you know, just over hundred grand my first year. Uh, of course the profits are significantly less, but I knew that, man, if I'm doing this part-time, I know I can rig this back up. Yeah, so, and th at, that was what uh the birth of the I think it was the hundred book challenge or like hundred book a week challenge. I think I I did that when I was starting with books. Yeah, and and I really I started the blog. So the bookflipper.com was kind of the first piece of content. And then of course we had the Facebook group, but I was in other people's Facebook groups. Uh Husha Moore uh was was really instrumental. Um Bob Willie, I think, runs the same group. So I was in their group. And all I was doing is I, I just started making blog posts and I didn't really have a major goal. I just realized that being an entrepreneur can be lonely. It's hard to meet people. If you run into someone in the field, they're kind of like, hey, go away. You're my competition <laughs> versus yeah. like there's so many cool people out there. That's why we're having this conversation right now. And so I, I realized like, all right, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to make some content and I'm, I'm very analytical by nature and said, I'm just going to start sharing like Mythbusters, but for books. So you see it all the time, but it was really common back then. People were saying, well, if a book's ranked over a million, don't buy it. It'll never sell. And so I would just take those common misconceptions and just write a blog post about it and say, is that true? Well, no. And here's counter examples. And here's what sales rank means. And I just started writing posts that were answering questions that were showing up in the group. And then what would happen is at first I had to ask permission. You don't just want to go spam a Facebook group. But I'd say, Husha, here's, you know, I keep seeing this post or here's someone doing that. Do you mind, like, can you share the blog post or do you care if I share it? And, uh, you know, people would, what, what really started to hit an inflection point was when people started sharing the posts, like other people that didn't know me, someone else would write a, a, a question and say, hey, I found this book. It's ranked, you know, 1.3 million. The profit's 80 bucks. Should I buy it? You know, I've heard that books over a million don't sell, don't sell. And somebody else I didn't even know would share, hey, check out the book flipper. He, he wrote an article on this. And they would share the post and then people would follow it. And I was building an email list. And 
that's really how it started to ramp up from there. That's awesome. How, how instrumental were those Facebook groups in the early years of, uh, of flipping books? Uh, they're huge. I mean, I, I can't downplay it. I I've seen a lot of small businesses come and go. It's, you know, it's, it's tough to do not just in the flipping space, but, but anything restaurants and, um, you know, software businesses, there's a lot of really good ideas out there, but if you don't have a community, if you don't have the ability to find customers or create customers, you just, you, you'll be dead on arrival. There's this idea that if you build it, they will come, or if you just build a great product, then of course it's going to go viral. And that's not the case. So the, without the Facebook groups, without getting some of that initial success and kind of building that community, there would never be, you know, eFlip was the first tool we launched. Scout IQ was eventually the goal, repping the gear. Got to get yeah. you guys some of that as well. But it, <laughs> without the community, without those original Facebook groups, you know, I'd like to think I'd still be where I am today and where our team is today and, and, and all of that. But I, I don't know that we would have got there. Maybe we, we would have found a different pathway to get there. But you, you need people. Yeah, we kind of, I think I kind of touch on this in like every episode the importance of having people around you doing the same thing that you're doing. Like, I don't think I would be where I'm at without Instagram, definitely without miles and Garrett and some other of our close friends yeah. being able to like bounce ideas off each other and go through similar mistakes and learn from each other's is probably the most important thing in this business, at least for me. For sure. And, you know, just like, for example, I'm not super technical. So I was, you know, fixing a sink the other day. And when it comes to like house repairs or swapping out a, a doorknob or putting in a smart lock, that we have a beautiful thing. We just literally type the brands. You say, Hey, I'm trying to put in a, you know, a smart lock or an Arlo ring doorbell. You just look up, look it up on YouTube and someone else has already done that content, created it, walked you through step-by-step step how to do it. And all you have to do is watch a couple seconds, pause it, go do that step, go to the <laughs> next, like we, Oh yeah. We're, we're instantly connected and that allows us just to do unbelievable things. That's what we call being a YouTube trained professional. There it is. Yeah, man. <laughs> YouTube was uh, essential in my life. Still is today. I mean, I use it every day. Seriously. And again, like learning, having, you know, face-to-face -face or Zoom face-to-face, -face, whatever you want to call it, all of that is, is super helpful. I, I've met some people that go, you know, they, they kind of poo-poo it and say, well, why would I go and share my secrets with a, with a group of people? I don't want more competition. And I think that's extremely limited. Now, most people have one or two, you know, really good products or sources or locations or ideas, and they'll keep those to themselves, but you can share the, the third, fourth, fifth best ideas and people can learn from it. The other thing I saw was people that were, you know, maybe, you know, multi-million dollar sellers, or they thought really highly of themselves. And they'd go, what am I going to learn from a conference with mostly newbies? And the opposite's actually true. And David Chung actually taught me this. He, he sells a couple million bucks a year. Thank He's God. a big bookseller uh, out in Colorado. And he goes, Caleb, I love going to these conferences. I go, why? You're like, you're light years ahead of us. You're running this amazing operation. What are these small players possibly going to teach you? He goes, here's the thing. Some of these people are extremely smart. They've figured out like just nuanced ways to gain efficiency. And they're, that like efficiency gain at their scale at a thousand books a month is nice. It's helpful. And they're going to share that with me. And David's, you know, touching, you know, a hundred thousand books a month. So that efficiency tactic that he can pick up, yeah. someone's going to share that, he can actually leverage that. And at his scale, that's going to save him tens of thousands of dollars a year. Whereas the person that thought of it might only save, you know, a thousand bucks a year. And right. yeah, you can think of it as creating your competition or like creating your colleagues, you know, like honestly, like, you know, Garrett, Danny and I, we're great friends, you know, we're in the same space, but it kind of is colleagues in a sense. And the best part I like about all this stuff is we kind of choose, you know, what little groups we can join and everything and who we interact with. And I think that's unbelievably valuable. And it shows that like, you know, over the years, like great things can happen. So what was kind of the evolution from just being a bookseller and obviously, you know, scaling that up to great numbers and kind of moving into more like you're doing like the software side and some of the other stuff you've gotten into in the same Amazon book selling vertical. Most of it was scratching my own itch and just trying to, to make better tools for, for my software. So I guess the first piece of software I sold was the tracking spreadsheet. So it was a listing spreadsheet. I was a spreadsheet junkie. I didn't really know much about software. I did a little bit of iPad like design um, at Johnson & Johnson. We like worked back when the iPad first came out. We did like some apps on it and they were 
crazy expensive and took you know three times longer than we thought to develop them which i probably should have just taken as a red flag and stayed far away from software because you know all that's true um but i made a tracking spreadsheet because i said there's not really good tools amazon seller central still isn't that great but back then it was even less great it was downright <laughs> awful and so the idea of trying to like have a handle on my business and know like what am i putting in what is it turning into in terms of not just sales but like revenue and or you know profit net income what are my margins what's my return how do i file taxes like all of those question marks but mostly just business intel to say hey is this business working and if i do want to try and quit my job can this work so i just built the tools for me and then realized well if i kind of make it prettier and make videos about it, i could probably sell this and you know we started selling the, the spreadsheet i think it was 70 bucks when we first launched it we've kind of slowly pushed it up because that helps sell i guess every time you say hey price is going up people buy a lot so we kind of got hooked on that but it's a 170 dollars spreadsheet now and that was kind of the first tool i sold and you know at first people go 70 bucks for a spreadsheet why would i pay that um and the, i you can either focus on that as a creator and go well they're probably right they could just create it or you go no this you know, I got a couple hundred hours of my time building this, fine tuning it, making sure it fits and works in my business. If someone else, even if they knew how to do a spreadsheet and build that all out, if they wanted to do it, what's their time worth? Even if it's 10 hours at seven bucks an hour, they should just pay for mine anyway. So it started, that's kind of when I realized that the, the audience was bigger, I could make these tools and then people came back. And of course, some people buy it and never use it, but I got people coming back and going, Caleb, I, you know, I got my first sales. I didn't know what I was doing. I got your spreadsheet. Now, like I have a plan. I like, I want to quit my job or I have quit my job and just seeing like that it was actually being used and it was useful was like, you know, that, that just felt really good. Yeah. The so spreadsheet was super impactful for me as well. Yeah. I'm a um, I mean, we know, we know people who still use well. it. Yeah. Me and my oh, yeah, adopters I, of it. I still sell a couple a month and you know, it, it's some nice golf money and whatever else that comes in, but it's, you know, it's, it's a useful tool for sure. Yeah. Black Friday, you typically post about it each I year. Do. It's right. Yeah. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Black Friday, two years ago, yeah. 2019 was when I bought it. I remember I was yeah. every day I was in school. I wasn't making much with books, but I would go in and I would enter in my sales on my own Excel spreadsheet. And I just bought the yep. tracking spreadsheet, made it all easier. I was, yeah. Meaning to ask. So you built the tracking spreadsheet yourself. Yeah, I did. I did probably 80% of it. And then when I was trying to make it where it was foolproof, so I, I kind of made it work and it was clunky. And I realized that if someone, you know, at my scale at the time, I might've had 50,000 rows, but I knew people that had hundreds of thousands of rows and that really starts to slow Excel up. Well, my, uh, I have an older brother who is pretty good at macros, which is kind of the programming language. Uh, it's visual basic, but it's behind uh, Excel. So I got the spreadsheet in front of him, walked him through it and said, hey, can you uh, can you like make this dummy proof? So idiots like me or people that aren't familiar with spreadsheets Us. can click a button and make it work. Us. Right. Yeah. And then can you make it efficient so that it doesn't take you know an hour to update because it, it, that was starting to happen as it got bigger? And he said, yep. And uh, I didn't have a lot of money to pay him. I said, tell you what, I'll give you a royalty. So I think I pay him like $15 off every spreadsheet that sells. I give him, you know, a little royalty check. So that was nice. And then of course that's more incentives to raise the price. Cause if I'm giving him 15 bucks on 70 and you know, I raised the price to 170, 15 bucks doesn't hurt as much. Very true. So he's done okay off of it. Uh, and, and that was really nice. It's kind of fun to work with him on things and, um, you know, of course I go market it and, and update it, but anytime we get in the weeds on something or Amazon changes the formats, I tap them on the shoulder and say, Hey, time to, time to fix this a little bit. So that, that kind of opened the door. I don't know who I followed or like studied or anything, but I knew that an email list was really important. And so even when I had the blog, I just said, I, there was an option that said, Hey, if you want to get notified when a new blog post comes out, Drop your email address in here. I think I was using MailChimp back in the day. We use Ooh. Trek now. Yeah, Mail MailChimp gets a lot of heat, but I think they just sold for like ten billion dollars or, or something crazy. Uh, I really like ConvertKit. They're worth a lot a more than guy. that. Uh, yeah. There's some silly money in, in email stuff, but it, it's hard to get it to be you know, fast to to get it to actually be delivered. You know, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that goes into it. I love ConvertKit. Uh, Nathan Barry runs the company. I read his blog. I've learned a ton from him. But they didn't integrate with Stripe back in the day. And once we got going, it's really hard to switch over. 
And so we've just, we've stuck with drip and I met Matthew along the way. He's, he's really gifted on the marketing side, uh, doing the email management, funnel management, SEO, uh, even some of the advertising, like that's, that's not my specialty at all. So I guess I learned as, as I went along, even with the programming, I don't program, I don't know how to program code onto an app or to a website. So you have to find people around you. You have to like figure out how to incentivize them, how to pay them, and then figure out just how to go have fun on the journey and go build, build stuff that solves problems. I like that. Yeah. Cause it really, at the end of the day, like tracking spreadsheet, accounting, new price, uh, in terms of like repricing strategies and all that. So very, very cool. So pretty much you were just selling as many books as you can. And then eventually, you know, people started paying attention. So you're like, let me, uh, you know, let me do some stuff year with that and so i was meaning to ask you guys bringing back the turn the page conferences next year um we've had a lot of people ask we we want to so um travis ran with acceler list and myself we uh we put on the conferences uh matthew helps and you know our team helps as well we definitely stopped we had five planned last year i think we did the first in january or february right before the world shut down and uh we of course canceled the rest of them so there's been a lot of people asking. We, we definitely want to bring it back. I don't know if there's a right time. We might just start throwing them on the calendar and see who shows up. But mm -hmm. Yeah, Danny uh, and I were planning on going to the, the Washington, D.C. one, of uh, what, which would have been yeah, yeah. September, I think, 2020. Well, we didn't even think about that, but that was right around the election time. So even if COVID didn't oh. exist, being, I mean, even without all the madness that ensued at the Capitol, just that time of year in an election season to be in DC is not a good idea. Yeah. I remember we were talking about that in Miami. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. that, that, that was probably not the, the wisest decision, but we're like, Hey, we wanted to kind of, I think we did seven of them before everything shut down. So we did Vegas. That was our most attended one. We did Los Angeles. We did Austin, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago. Uh, Maybe I don't think we did Denver. That was kind of on the list. We were looking at DC. We're just trying to hit the major metropolitan areas, yeah. essentially. Gotcha. So, so uh, question. So, in terms of our viewers, a lot of our viewers are probably balancing Amazon as well as you know some sort of corporate job as as well as you were. Can you talk us through like the decision, the mindset leading up to the day you quit your job, and then ultimately how you kind of continued to scale past that? That's a, that's a great question. So I get that question a lot and I'll, I'll definitely share my experience and hopefully that, that helps resonate with somebody. Um, I definitely start on the side. If, even if you like hear about this and you're really massively prone to action, that's great. That'll help you as an entrepreneur. But if you've got a, a, a pretty good paying job or something that kind of helps cover the bills, don't just quit because you heard about NFTs or flipping products or whatever. <laughs> keep that, keep that stability. What I would recommend is study up on your personal finances. Most people in America make this much money and they spend this much thanks to credit cards and debt and everything else. And most people that are not in that category will spend up like right here. There's no margin, there's no gap. And then they get a raise and they bump their standard of living up and they get a raise and they bump their standard of living up. What that does is one, it's super stressful. If you have, you catch a nail in a tire and you gotta go pony up 500 bucks for four new tires because you're driving something all wheel drive or whatever. You, you don't even have 500 bucks to do that, right? So an extra bill comes due, something breaks down. That's, that's just no way to live. So as much as you can, try and create some sort of margin, both in your business, but also in your life. I think that's extremely important because if you can create this margin, all of a sudden you're not trying to replace this income, you're trying to replace what your expenses are. So you can always make more money. You, you can only pinch so low, but um, a good book on that is I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi, S-E-T-H-I. So check out that one. It's kind of a silly sounding name, but a, a great read and talks you through that. So try and create some margin and then just do it on the side and do it on the side as long as you can. Um, your goal should be, again, ideally you want to replace your income or maybe make more. You got to know what you're after. Are you trying to make money? Nothing wrong with that. If you want to go get filthy rich, have at it. Are you after freedom? Are you yeah, after, you know, time, what are you, yeah. you got to figure out what you're looking for before you go start. Otherwise you won't, you know, you won't know if you're, if you're successful. Yeah. And with, uh, oh my, with a lot of the stuff we talk about, like a lot of, and not, not necessarily like book selling, but a lot of like, like 
drop shipping as like a lot of online businesses are marketed by people with Lamborghinis and stuff talking about making tons of money <laughs> yeah. when a lot of people would like really benefit from just like, you know, a thousand bucks profit selling books or flipping stuff on the side. And I think that's a really good point to consider what you're after. Cause that's something I try to include in a lot of like my beginner content as well, just kind of showing people to really consider what they're going for. Yeah. And, and a couple of things along that line as, as I'll, I'll keep sharing the story, but you got to be in the game to know if it's working. So it's one thing to read stories or follow people on social media that are, that are flipping products. And you're like, man, that's crazy. I could never do that. Or wow, that's really easy. Of course I could do it. But if you're not actually trying, you don't know if it works for you or not. You don't know if you like it. You don't know if it actually works. They could be, you know, full of nonsense. It might not be real. Mm -hmm. So get in the game and you don't have to be perfect. I was actually talking with, uh, I've got a, uh, kind of was trying to hire an assistant, ended up hiring someone with much better skill sets than that. Um, so he's helping out in a lot of the businesses. He's local, happens to be an excellent golfer, which is a nice plus. Um, his name's John. So if you guys email and you have a John reply, that's that's who it is. So you brought him to Florida, didn't you? Yeah, good guy. I did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, should have just led with that. You'd be like, yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. So John's oh, awesome. Oh, the food poisoning, right? The food poisoning. Yep, yep, that's him. <laughs> yep. Uh, not alcohol poisoning, apparently, but food poisoning. That's, so. What I, that's what I was thinking. So we were we were swapping out uh, some locks at the house here, just doing a couple like small house projects in between answering emails and whatnot. And we were talking about like the 80-20 rule. And, and that's very true in business. Like you're going to get 80% of your results from 20% of your efforts or 80% of your outputs come from 20% of the inputs. And we talked about that, but we said, you know what? Like, Part of figuring out what door handles were on the doors and trying to get them off took a while. And then, of course, doing the second door was easier than the first because we knew how it worked. But the fine tune aspects of like getting everything lined up, like you could throw the handle back on and the latch and get it all lined up really quickly. So you get 80% of the way done with your project in a couple minutes, you know, in 20% of the time. But that last little bit, getting it all perfectly lined up, getting the face plate to match, screwing it in, making sure it's tight, making sure everything is perfect. That's the last 20% that takes longer, right? But can you 80-20 a door? Not really. You got to finish the job, right? right. The, the, the door doesn't do any good if it's 80% done. So all that to say, uh, that just kind of resonated. So I don't, I don't know if that even clicked. But, but the goal with, like, with books or a side hustle, whatever you're going to do, is you don't, there, is no, there is no done. There's no finished right? So when you're going to go start flipping books, step one is just get in the game. So if you want to start flipping a product or getting into wholesale or whatever it is, find a really easy way to get started. They call it an MVP or minimum viable product. Just get started. And if you buy a couple bad books and they're not great flips or whatever, and you make some mistakes, oh, well, don't go buy $10,000 NFTs if you don't have that kind of money, but don't be afraid to go waste a couple bucks on, you know, books that might not sell or, or, grocery items that may not sell. Um, don't over engineer, or overanalyze the opportunity. Just go get started. Once you're in the game, once your ship is moving, then you can start navigating it and trying to steer it. Otherwise, you're just guessing. So get started. That's what I did uh, on the side. And then my goal was to replace my expenses. So I wasn't trying to replace six-figure salary. That seemed really intimidating. And again, just because someone sells six figures on Amazon doesn't mean they're making six figures, right? Uh, usually far from it. Your margins are going to be anywhere from 10 to you know, 30, 40% on the high end. So you know, selling 100 grand is cool. It's, you know, it's not easy, but it doesn't mean that you can replace a $100,000 salary either. So the goal for me was to try and get to you know, 40, 50, 60K of net knowing that if I could start approaching that, then I, I was well on my way to actually step in, stepping off the cliff. So as I got closer to that, that phase, all of the, the fear, all of the, what are people gonna think? I'm such a people pleaser. And so I, my, my coworkers, I had a great team. Of course, there's some people I don't miss, but most of the people were awesome. And you know, I didn't want to, like, they, they were my people. We went on trips together. We had water cooler talk. We chatted about stocks and you know life and families and all that stuff. It was great. And I was worried, what are they going to think? And you also tell yourself, hey, I'm important. You know, Johnson & Johnson needs Caleb Roth in this seat on their team doing these things. And the sales reps, I was, I love the sales team. I was really well connected out there. And you just tell yourself they, they need me to do the job. 
the reality is once you leave, they don't. So, so I agonized, you know, what's my family going to think? What are my friends going to think? J and J is a very secure career. You know, they have pension, they're going to take care of you. You can work for them a long time and your earning potential could just, you know, over time continue to skyrocket. They'll, they'll lump you in with some stocks and all kinds of stuff, right? They try and, they try and get you hooked, but they're also not loyal. They could can you tomorrow if they decide to downsize or shut off a team. And uh, I realized that. So I, I really agonized with the decision and finally went in. I knew that the, the, the company was trending in the right direction with the books. I knew I could get to that point where I could, like, I was, I was secure. I had a little buffer, a little safety net in the bank that, you know, even if I didn't make money over the next couple of months, as I tried to ramp the business up, I'd be okay. So all of those things by not just being rash and walking in, in 2014 and saying, I quit by waiting a year, having that goal trying to save as much money as possible so that I could feel more comfortable about stepping out. That, that was really important. And then leading up to it, uh, you know, I finally went in and told my boss and of course word got around pretty quickly. And it was funny because I thought people would come in and go, you're a moron. And what are you thinking? And it was the opposite. People came into the cubicle. Uh, I didn't have an office. I wasn't that fancy, but they would kind of come into the cubicle and go, I am so happy for you. Take me with you. Whatever you're doing, I don't know what it is, but take me with you, get me out of here. And you just realize there's a lot of dissatisfied people in you know any job, right? It's and there's nothing wrong with working for somebody else. I've got a lot of employees on my team, and I'm glad they're with me. If they ever want to go off on their own, I want to you know cheer them on and be a cheerleader and, and let them spread their wing their wings, so to speak. But there's nothing wrong with working for somebody. That's just not who I am. That's not what I wanted. So. They were, they, you know, replaced me quickly. There was a new, new person in there, you know, a month later. And you know, as, in, as far as J and J is concerned, I'm sure they don't really miss me. So all the lies you tell yourself, everything else, you know, it got weird at first. Cause you know, people go, what do you do for a living? And I go, I sell books on the internet and they go, uh, what else do you do for a living? Like, no, that's it. Like there's money in that. And they, it just kind of got to be this awkward conversation all the time until I finally just started telling people I'm in e-commerce. <laughs> that's what that's just, what I say as well. Yeah, it's that just was, it's just simpler. I I, yep. I experienced that a lot in college when people were asking like what I was doing with all these boxes and everything. And I was like, oh, selling books. Uh, yeah. They're like, wow. But I mean, it, it works. I mean, it really does. Even still to this day, it's still. I mean, probably any library in the country at some point during the week through donated books or whatever has profitable books just sitting there waiting for someone to buy them. Yep. Yeah. So. And, uh, Oh, my bad. You got it. Very good. I, I'm just going to kind of finish that story up with like, and again, it depends on what your goal is. Like for me, I wanted freedom. I wanted to run my own, my own business, have the flexibility. I knew like, and I work, you know, if my Instagram looks like I just play golf and, uh, you know, hang out with my buddies all the time, but I work, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks still, but it doesn't feel like it all the time. I enjoy it. I, a lot of times I'm in the local coffee shop, chit chatting with friends, but also cranking through and working on projects. So I get to set my hours. If I want to be in you know, Mexico hanging out with Avery, I can do that. If I want to be on the road, I can do that. So that freedom and flexibility is ultimately really important to me. But if that's not important for you, you'd rather have the security of a job. You don't need to be on the road. If you want the health insurance and you know, the safety net that, that work provides in a lot of cases, then your side hustle might just be a way, like let's say you're making this much money at work, you keep asking for raises, but you can't. Inflation's creeping up. Your expenses are creeping up. If you don't have much margin, your side hustle might just be the margin. That's all it is. And that's that's great. Your goal doesn't have to be to quit the job. Like you said, that extra $500, $1,500 a month might be the difference between this and your one slip up away from you know not having any money in the bank to actually having a little bit of margin that gives you a, some breathing room, lets you take a couple of days off work without worrying where the next you know paycheck's going to come from. Um, or not, you know, maybe it's an extra vacation. So figure out what you're after, figure out your why, and then your side hustle can either just be that, or I would always recommend, unless you're in college where great, go be a student and have a side hustle. And then maybe, maybe that'll take off and who knows what it turns into, but that's, that's kind of what I would offer in terms of that. Yeah. So I like your, that. Um, go ahead, Miles. No, 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 you got it. I was just, what is your day-to-day -day like now, obviously having the businesses that you're running now, what does your day-to-day -day look like apart from the golf? Uh, well, we're getting cold here in Indiana. So golf is uh, nearly out of the equation. 
So that, that means I'll be more productive in the winter. Uh, every day is different. I do run a number of businesses. Uh, I've got a fair amount of investments to do some Airbnb properties as well. Um, and so one of the, the challenges for me is building right now, I, my, my biggest weakness this year is standard operating procedures. And it's very basic and you know, Avery does a really good job and I've got some friends like David, especially that are just very gifted that way. And it's fine when it's just you because I'm pretty off the cuff. My office is a little bit messy. That's kind of the way I work. But when you're trying to manage multiple things and when you try and bring another person on your team and turn over responsibility to them, it quickly becomes apparent. And John has had to deal with a lot of that as I brought him on board over the last couple of months where I go, you know, here's how to do this task. Just watch it, take a couple notes, and then you're good to go, right? And he's like, yeah, sure. And then, you know, he'll do 80% of it the next time and he'll forget. And that's not on him. That's on me. I never documented the process because it was me doing it. But I'm realizing, like, I'm still doing my own bookkeeping. I'm still doing a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks. And that that's just wasted effort. Like, today was almost all bookkeeping. Now, that's part of part of the agreement. I've got to pay all my consignment clients for uh, the book business. I've got to pay all the business partners and the software businesses. I've got to catch up and kind of get ready for taxes, which is coming up. I don't know about you guys. We're it's November four. I don't know if you want to share the date that we're recording, but it's November four. Yeah, it's all right. And every time the calendar switches into November, it's like, oh man, we've got Thanksgiving. My birthday's right after that. Not, not that anybody cares. You guys can send me gifts. I'll give you my address. Uh, Christmas and you know the end of the year is going to be done faster than we think of course Black Friday you guys mm -hmm. you know doing a lot of things outside of books your best two months of the year are coming up as well I'm excited yeah so it's fun but these next two months just slip away and it's kind of that that inner urgency starts to kick uh, in heavily as the calendar turns into November so day-to-day -day is very different right now I'm desperately trying to set up more standard operating procedures I've actually been hiring a fair amount of VAs. I was kind of behind the curve there. So the uh, onlinejobs.ph, great place to find them. I've got a, a handful. Here, here's the funny thing. People are going, even in our town and pretty much any town in the country, every business is hiring, right? Especially fast food, restaurant industry, but even just like basic jobs, office jobs, you know, even like lawyers, any, like anybody, there's just not enough talent right now. As we're going completely virtual or nearly completely virtual, there's a whole talent pool opened up all over the world that is going to work for way less money than, than we're willing to work for. Um, I put a job post for like data, just like data crunching, looking at some websites, doing a little bit of research, plugging it into some spreadsheets, nothing crazy complex. It just is time consuming. Put it at $2.50 an hour on onlinejobs.ph. And within 72 hours, I had over 800 applicants. Yeah. Yeah. I think so, we've all hired people from online jobs, PH. Yeah, it's yeah, great. It's crazy. So again, there's 800 people and you look it up and the average income in the Philippines is about five or six grand a year, which is 250 to $3 an hour for the year. And most of the Filipinos I've interviewed, this is a second job for them. You know, they're just trying to work oh, yeah. really hard and, and make as much money as they can. And on one hand, it's like, I, that seems wrong to pay that little. On the other hand, like I talk to the people I hire, They've got families. They're they, some of them have their own houses. They have a car. They they have iPhones. They go shopping on Friday night when they get paid. Like their lives are are great, and they are they are hungry to work. They're eager to work, and anything that can be done remotely and digitally. If we're too lazy to go find jobs, it's going to quickly spread, and uh, we're we're going to see a lot more talent coming from overseas. That's for sure. So that's that's kind of what I've been trying to do is, is figure out how to get myself out of the minutia. I should not be doing bookkeeping in my business. That's not the most valuable thing that Caleb can do in all of my businesses. It's important to see the numbers and make sure I'm making good informed decisions. But me going in, I use wave apps, me going in and categorizing transactions and trying to figure out where that missing penny went is not the best use of my time. So a lot of my day to day right now is is trying to figure out how to set that up hire as many people as I can so that I can then, you know, drive the company forward and, and set the vision for it. Gotcha. Very well said um, on all that. So in terms of like the beginners listening, what is the best route for getting started purely on Amazon? Like right now where the current climate of just Amazon in general, like, do you think that's books, 
Do you think it's other types of stuff or what would be like your main tips? Cause our audience does consist of a lot of beginners. Uh, it depends on one, where you live two what you like to do. The, the reason I'm drawn to books and drawn to bourbon, uh, especially is it's the same game. You're walking into a store and you don't know what you're going to find. So there's a phrase, uh, I'm going to forget. There's a gentleman out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. He just passed away. He did a, um, man, I'm going to forget his name. He wrote a book called The Thrill of the Hunt. I guess I could just Google that. Uh, Forrest Fenn. Have you guys heard of him? He hit a treasure like worth over a million bucks somewhere. And he wrote this poem, which was called The Thrill of the Hunt uh, or The Thrill of the Chase, one of the two. And it was like this poem that was out there for seven years before anybody found the treasure. And somebody just found it this past year and then Forrest passed away a couple months later. It was kind of keeping him alive, actually, um, in wow. terms of hoping someone would find it. Anyway, you're, anybody can go read that. It's kind of a, a cool story. But the thrill of the hunt is what kind of drives me. So you walk into a store, you don't know, and this applies to any kind of retail arbitrage. You don't know what you're going to find today. You might go find an amazing product and you know, have the potential to make a grand or two. You might drive all over town and literally strike out and find nothing. And if you're okay with that, it's really fun because your highs are really high. You can make more money in a day than you could have in a month at your day job. But you also have dry periods where you just you barely find anything. So understand your, your personal um, drive, your personal desire to deal with disappointment or rejection or, or any of those types of things. And if you're in a really small town, books may not be the easiest place to start because there might not be a lot of them that you have access to. So books are, are easy. They're everywhere. They're cheap. Our app, of course, a little shameless plug for Scout IQ makes it easy to research them. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, it literally turns green and says, buy the book or red, don't buy the book. And of course, there's way more to it than that. But if you don't want to take the effort, again, get in the game, 80-20 this, like just get started, start with books. It's a great, great chance. You're not typically gated on most books. It's really easy to get into from an Amazon perspective. Then once you're in the game, then say, all right, do I like books? Is it good? Do I want to try and scale that up? We have a great Facebook community, the book flipper community. You can ask 20,000 of your closest friends. Uh, you know, what are ways I can scale this up and people will help you. It's surprising, even though you're their competition. Um, and then we have, we, I kind of joke books are the gateway drug. You know, most of you started with books and I know miles, you're kind of switching gears and a, a lot of our customers eventually switch gears. Some stick with it and they ramp up and they do bulk books and we've got tools and we love helping them as well. But the ones that want to move on great books are a great place to learn the game. And then once you have the skill set to spot value, to understand the logistics of how to list it, price it, ship it, deal with customers, all you have to do then is figure out what do you like to find? Do you like finding deals with suppliers? Great, get into wholesale. Do you like being creative and trying to find products? Cool, try your hand at private label. Like there's so many different iterations of ways to flip or ways to make money online. You don't have to just stay with any one thing. If you like content, Go create a Discord channel. I know, Miles, you're crushing it with that. Like, go, if you love sharing your story, document it, put it on YouTube or TikTok. Like, there's so many ways to, one, put yourself out there and meet people. And if you're shy and don't want to do that, cool. You can hide behind a computer screen and just flip products. So there's, there's a lot of ways to play with it. And you just have to figure out what you're after. Are you trying to come up with a full-time job? Is a part-time gig or a side hustle? Is that adequate? Um, and then what do you like doing? And just... There's, I promise you can find some way to, to combine those two, something that makes money and something you enjoy doing. All right. Really good stuff there. We really appreciate it. We really don't appreciate you shaving the mustache. I know I was well. teasing, you, <laughs> teasing you about it uh, before we were getting on, but I think uh, we get really enjoy hearing your story with everything like that. I'm sure our viewers um, will really enjoy it, but uh, anything else, boys? No, very well said. All right. All right. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Caleb, for coming on. And thank you to our viewers who made it this far in the episode. We really appreciate it. If you're on YouTube, make sure to subscribe because a lot of you who are watching on YouTube aren't yet subscribed. So please consider doing that. But thank you guys for listening to another episode of the Buy Box Bandits podcast.